Welcome to the Habitat Podcast, the podcast for wildlife habitat management, hunting strategy, and land stewardship. And now, your host, Jared Van Hees. Welcome back, everybody, to the Habitat Podcast, where we are here to become better habitat managers. I hope everybody had a Merry Christmas and we're getting ready to kick off 2021 slash habitat season. It's right around the corner. So happy new year to y'all as well. We have a great episode for you here today. We have Lincoln Roan and Chad Thalen. Now you guys have heard from these guys before, but now we're talking habitat as well as cult of packers and real estate. So habitat wise, we talk about some frost seeding. We talk about timber a recent harvest lincoln had done on his land we talk about prescribed fire and just getting the gears turning for uh january here we even talk about hinge cutting and then we also go into a pretty cool discussion on you know real estate where the market's at what you can do to what you can do to improve your property if you're looking to sell or um what buyers are looking for what acres are going for right now it's a really cool chat. It was great catching up with these guys. And, um, you know, it's just, I hope we learned something from this because there's a ton of information. I listened to the episode again yesterday and I loved it. So here we are, guys, Chad Thalen and Lincoln Roan. Um, first, I want to mention the new Facebook group we have going. Almost 400 members already. We started this thing like two weeks ago. So there's a bunch of people who have joined the group. It's called Habitat Chat on facebook habitat chat and uh, you can find that linked to our habitat podcast facebook page uh, or if you just search in groups uh, habitat chat there's a nice picture of a white tail on a food plot and uh, request to join and we'll get you in there and you know we just want to see your pictures any questions one guy's building a roller crimper um, another guy's talking about invasive species control in his woods right now hack and squirt there's a bunch of cool stuff going on in the group habitat chat so be sure to join and uh, we'd love to see you on there and, and have you contribute also if you haven't been to habitatpodcast.com lately you should check it out we have a new article in the habitat journal from our friend zach haas it's all about creating high quality water and ponds on your hunting property for your habitat so check that out at the habitat journal you can see that up at the top of habitatpodcast.com. We also have all of our brand new t-shirts and hats for sale on there. We have habitat manager shirts. So what those are on the front of it, it says habitat manager, deeming yourself as a habitat manager. And on the back of it, it's our awesome USA, you know, stars and bars flag dk or flag logo i should say with habitat podcast in the middle there it's really cool black t-shirt with white ink on it check that out under uh, habitatpodcast.com slash shop or under the gear tab on top there uh, lastly on the website we have our land plan services now we are booked into february already um might even be full up for february i have to take a look at that so if you're interested be sure to reach out right away that's over under land plans. You can go and submit your email address and we'll get right back to you on that. Um, we're filling up fast on those and guys are excited. Anywhere from Pennsylvania all the way to Nebraska. Uh, it doesn't matter. Just hit us up and we would love to help you out. Now, I want to talk about Realtree United Country Land Pro Lake States Realty and Auction. That is Chad Thalen's company. He's linked with Realtree. Lincoln Roan works there as well. Uh, as real estate agents here in the great state of Michigan, you can check them out from our website. Just click the logo on the homepage. It'll take you right there. You can see whatever listings are available and get yourself going. Or if you want to sell your property, Chad and Lincoln are great resources to reach out to to get it sold. They're selling properties within days right now. As soon as things become available, um, they're gone. Uh, we talk about that on this podcast episode, so you guys will see that. But it's really great. They're a partner of the show, and I'd love to send you guys over there and check them out. You can find them, again, on the homepage at HabitatPodcast.com. I also want to thank the Habitat Hook. Nick Nation is pumping out the hooks over there for Christmas and, of course, for TSI slash Hinge Cut slash Habitat season coming up here. I know I will have my 
aluminum extendable bright orange habitat hook out in the woods with me in January. That is an awesome hook. I've been using it for three years now. Looks brand new and uh, it's worth the money, guys, all day long. Uh, be sure to check them out at uh, the Habitat Hook on Facebook or you can go to habitatpodcast.com hit the Habitat Hook link, and that'll take you over there as well. There are also links, guys, to everything I mentioned right now. There are links to all of these in the show notes to this episode. So if you're listening to the podcast, all you have to do is scroll down in the details, and you'll have a direct link to everything I just mentioned, which just makes it easier for you to find and uh, helps us out by, you know, if you guys can show our partner some love, that's awesome. So I want to thank uh, HuntWise, Killer Food Plots, Packer Max Cult of Packers, Michigan Whitetail Pursuit, Sound Barrier Hunting, and Morse Nursery. Also for their support in this episode, I want to thank you listeners the most for being loyal and coming back once again. We love providing these for you guys in 2021. It's going to be awesome. So thank you very much. Let's get into it right now. Winter Habitat, Real Estate, Cult of Packing with Lincoln Roan and Chad Thaler. All right, guys, we're live. We are back. We have uh, a pretty fun episode for you guys tonight. Also very informative. We have the trusty co-host, Mr. Brian Hobble on the line. Brian, how you doing tonight, sir? Doing well. How about you? Not bad. Not bad. I just um, drew all over my, my sink in the bathroom with some toothpaste for Elf on the Shelf, which I'm going to have to clean up myself tomorrow. So uh, that's cool. <laughs> Yeah, um, I remember those days. Going. Yeah, what's what's new over in your neck of the woods? Uh, got a couple of hunts in PA. We had uh, gun season was open until Saturday here. So that's wrapped up until after Christmas, and then archery comes back in. And uh, you can go flintlock. We've got a flintlock season after Christmas. But uh, archery still open in Ohio and uh like we were talking before we started recording I think Lincoln mentioned the uh second gun season in Ohio coming up this weekend which I'll be heading to the lease for nice and other than that just getting things wrapped up for Christmas and catching up with my daughter she's home from college so awesome man good to hear good to hear and you mentioned one of our uh, special guests already we have Mr. Lincoln Roan on the line how you doing tonight Link Hey, I'm doing well, Jared. How you guys doing? Brian, what's up, man? Doing good. And then lastly, we have uh, none other than Mr. Chad Thalen from Realtree United on the line. What's up, Chad? Hey, man. How you all doing? Doing well. Thank you. Really uh, appreciate you guys coming on tonight. We have a fun one. We haven't caught up in a minute, so it would be great to uh, do that here tonight. We're going to cover a few cool things tonight but before we get into that i guess i want to hear uh for anybody who doesn't know and who is brand new to the podcast lincoln let's start out with you let's hear a little bit about you um who you are where you're at what you do for a living that type of thing and then chad uh we'll go to you next all right so my name is lincoln roan and uh um i am the owner of uh, packer max best outdoors packer max and um uh also, I'm a real estate agent with uh, Chad uh, with Real Tree United Country, and um, that's 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 my claim to fame. <laughs> that's about it. And um, happy to be here. It's a great show, and it's been very good for us. And, and so, thanks for having us. Of course, of course. And for anybody who doesn't know what Packer Max is, that those are the line of cult of Packers we talk about all the time on the show. So. And, uh, yeah. Mr. Mr. Chad Thalen. Yeah. Um, I won't repeat my name again. You got it covered. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, we own a couple, own a couple businesses, uh, Stony Creek outdoor properties. Oh, we've been doing whitetail habitat. Why I should say wildlife habitat, um, uh, and planting, uh, throughout the great lakes region. Um, since, Oh, the early thousands and um, uh, 2008 uh, started uh, in real estate. And so I also own the Lake States Realty and Auction. 
uh, and then our, you know, our affiliation with the Real Tree United Country Hunting Properties, which I got a, I got a comment on, Jared. You're you're getting better and better every podcast I listen to. You have such a long name. It was a little bit struggle there for a minute, but um, every every podcast it's uh, getting better. Appreciate it. No, of course, of course. I, uh, you know, I need to practice over here too. And, and, and it is quite the mouthful, but it's also uh, all encompassing of many different things. So, um, you know, when you want to, when you want to try to get every, everything out there that you do in terms of auction and, and Lake States, not just Michigan, you know, it's, uh, you got, sometimes you have to have a long name. No, I'm, I'm glad to have you guys on and, um, it seems like uh, business has been has been going well this year, uh, Lincoln. I think you're selling the selling a few culture packers, eh? Yeah, yeah. We've uh, we've just pretty much gotten overrun uh, this year, and uh, it's been it's been absolutely fantastic. Um, I am I am beyond elated with the progress that we've made over the last over the last twelve months, and uh, everything that's happened with Packer Max and and being able to uh, move into a new facility in Rockford, Michigan, and um, take advantage of that through this, and we've we've, you know, we've, there's been some bumps in the road along the way with you know with COVID, with the restrictions and whatnot, with manufacturing, but um, you know we've managed to work our way through that, and we learned a lot along the way, and um, you know it's just it's really been fantastic, and and I just can't tell you too how much. Um, you know, the, the Habitat podcast has benefited, you know, my business and, uh, uh, you know, with, with, with lear- listeners learning about, you know, the Packer Max and the, the importance of using a call to Packer. And, um, you know, it's, it's the final step of the whole process. And, and uh, there's other, there's, uh, there's other, you know, there's no plant, no, no plow techniques that you can use. And uh, it's just, it's just been, it really has been a fantastic year. Um, and, and I feel, I, I almost feel guilty on one hand because I know that there's so many businesses that are struggling right now. Um, but, uh, it's just, it's been crazy, crazy, crazy good for us. So, so I'm very, very thankful and very blessed. No, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that, especially, you know, throughout, throughout COVID, uh, you know, some people are up, some people are down and it's, it's uh, not really been fair for for a lot of people, but um, you got all you can do is work mm-hmm. hard and, and keep your head up and and keep driving your business. So, I mean, yep. if I know we have uh, for anybody who doesn't know, we do have a a podcast discount code for for the Packer Max. I know it's um, for any Packer. Is that still correct, or how is that working? Yeah, I have the yeah. uh, yep. the yep. discount code right yep. here. HPC 25 and then that uh that takes a 25 bucks off any model for all the for habitat podcast listeners okay okay and then um if anybody might be wondering you know should they get a a packer max or call to packer i guess real quickly because i know we have other episodes where we've already talked about this but uh like what are a couple of quick benefits that somebody might need to think about when thinking about a call to packer well, the kind of the, the Packer Max's claim to fame is is the fact that it's it's incredibly um, it's, it's very versatile. It's it's portable. Um, you know, you can drain you the, the it gets the weight from or the weight comes from water, so it holds about forty pounds of water. So, like the heavy duty model with water full, you know, wet weight is is four hundred pounds. Empty, it's a hundred pounds. So. So you can, you know, you can use it, drain it, take it to another property. You know, you can put it on a trailer. When you're done with it for the year, you can you can hang it in your pole barn. Um, but you know, as you're going through the process, you know, the the, the three the, the three or four main benefits are, you know, you, you get you increase your seed to soil contact. You uh, you you compact the soil, uh, keep it from drying out. It helps to retain moisture. Um, the grooves that it leaves in the soil, it channels that moisture and holds it there and allows it to absorb and, and stay put. Uh, it, it'll, it, 
it helps to, to minimize washout and heavier rains. Um, it's just, it's just, a it's the final step in the whole process. And it just, it helps, uh, take, you know, you, it's funny cause I get a lot of people that, that skip that final step with a call to packer and they just drag it with a fence drag or whatever, you know, and they get decent results, but, um, Using a call to packer, I get, I get so many people call me and say, I have never had food pots like I have had this year, you know, after using the Packer Max in, in that final step. And um, it's music to my ears because that's, you know, why would you spend, you know, all the time and money that we do spend on food pots, you know, the seed, the fertilizer, the, the equipment, and then, um, you know, your time. My gosh, our time is very valuable these days. And, and then skip that final step and wonder why, you know, maybe you're not getting quite the performance out of your food plot that, you know, that you should. And um, so, uh, you know, it's just, it's, there's a multiple, multiple advantages to having it. They're, they're, they're cost, you know, I mean, if you do a cost comparison, they're, they're far cheaper than, than cast iron. If you can't, you know, I can ship these things all over the country. I mean, I, matter of fact, I just, I just, just sent one to South Texas today, um, you know, and it's the HD, you know, with uh, with a wheel kit, it goes in three boxes, takes you about 15 minutes to put it together once you get it, you know, and you're ready to, pardon the pun, you're ready to roll. So, wow. um, you know, uh, you know, if you, and if you, and if you look at the cost of, um, you know, the cast iron unit, it's, it's, they're, they're, they're just far cheaper. Plus you can't, you can't, you know, ship a, a cast iron unit, you have to, you know, you'd have to ship it LTL or, or buy one locally. And, and, uh, but we can ship them all over the country all the way up to the, uh, you know, we ship the 3.8 footer, you know, uh, again, it, it, there's some assembly involved once you get it, but it's, it's super easy to put together. Um, you know, and, and they're going to last a very long time. And we've got, We've got many, many people out there that have been using these things for 10 years. Um, you know, my personal unit is nine years old, and I'm kind of trying to do my own testimonial and just, I'm just going to use the thing and just keep using it. And I just, out of my own testimony, to see how, you know, see how long it lasts. And we do 11 food plots every year. So, um, you know, it's not something that's you're going to have to replace every couple of years. It's, you know, there it's a long-term investment. So... Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I think, uh, our buddy Al has had one, uh, about that long as well. I know he, he mm-hmm. bought one before you owned the company a, a while back and it's kind of a, kind of a random happenstance to hear that he's already been using one for years, um, before I even met him. So it's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. There's in, in, you know, uh, the previous owner just kind of scratched the surface of what, you know, the potential was and, in, in uh, you know, now we're working on, as a matter of fact, I have a meeting tomorrow with, with our uh, engineers to, to finalize the design for the, uh, the roller crimper uh, flip over attachment. And uh, we're going to finalize the drawings and, and hopefully go into the prototyping phase of that and then the testing. And we're, we're really trying hard to be able to, to launch this thing for, you know, for the spring. And, uh, I'm, I'm super excited about that. That is besides the wheel kit. That's probably the most, uh, asked for item that, you know, uh, that I get is when are you going to come out with the roller crimper? <laughs> so <laughs> I know so I'm, I asked I'm you that the other day. <laughs> yep. You did. <laughs> What's happening with that? So, and, uh, you know, and, and again, it's taken, it's taken a minute to, to, to kind of put it all together because of the COVID thing and the delays that we've had. And, you know, we've right. been, just super busy all summer. And, and so my main focus was going to be to, you know, to work on it this winter and get it, get it rolled out. So, and come in at a, in a price point that, you know, that people can afford. And uh, if you already have an HD unit, you'll be able to add it to, you know, any existing HD unit out there. And uh, so it's going to be, it's going to be a a big, uh, a big seller. I believe there's a lot of guys going to it and, um, you know, with what we have designed and hopefully, you know, what we think is going to happen, we'll, it'll work. And, you know, you know, like I said, we got some testing to do and maybe some tweaking, but, um, it should be in good shape. So. 
That's awesome. Yeah, I, I think uh, if anybody wants to hear more about that or or hasn't heard our last episode with Lincoln, that was Habitat Podcast number 86. We talked about that along with some food mm-hmm. plot fencing and um, no-till seed mix and, and that sort of thing. So that's awesome, man. I'm excited for you. I'm excited yep. to see that crimper. I can't wait. Yeah, so, awesome. I am too. To I'm, I'm looking well. forward to it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jared. I appreciate it, man. And, and you know, and again, thanks for – you know, for you guys' support and, you you know, believing in the company and and uh, the product and and uh, getting it out there and getting, you know, getting in front of people. It, that's that's huge. Of course, sir. Of course. Yeah, it makes it real easy, especially this year with that drought that we had at the end of summer. I know I couldn't have had the plots that I had without using it, and uh, several of my friends are in the same boat if we wouldn't have use Packer Maxes. That would have never survived the, the drought and come up the way it did. Yep. Yep. I, and, and it's, it's amazing that, uh, you know, how well the, the little bit of moisture, it, it just helps to retain that moisture. And, and what little bit we got this past fall, you know, I'm in the same boat, you know, where we're at here in Michigan, we had a, just a monster drought. Yeah. And then all of a sudden in September, we got a little bit of rain and, you know, we had some, we had great plots. I mean, they, they turned out fantastic. And, um, you know, it's these days, it's not just a matter of throwing out some seed and, you know, and letting it do its thing. You know, you're, you're trying to, as habitat managers and gamekeepers, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to maximize our, our nutrition for our herd and, and, uh, not only to, to feed them, but, to keep them on our properties to protect them. And, uh, you know, get them into the next age class. So it's kind of a, kind of a, uh, the circle of the circle of food plots. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. I know um, that we did have a super, super big drought and um, ended up getting just enough rain to, to have some growth, but mine's all mowed down again now. So I need some more tonnage next year. That drought can, that drought can stay away. Um, that wasn't, I went yeah. on no-till this year and that drought, uh, the, the drought and the no-till or, or throw and throw and grow or throw and pack or whatever you want to say. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I need some rain when you do that. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that, that is true. You know, when you're doing the, the no-till you do have, it, it, it helps, it helps soil moisture, but you do got to have some moisture there. So yep. same thing with, you know, I mean, it's, if you don't have moisture, it ain't gonna it ain't gonna grow. So, and the crimping trying to, aspect. Trying to make, what's that? The crimping aspect of all that, you know, will just um, leapfrog you, you know, another step above too. Mm-hmm. When it, if you're in that drought, yep, yep. I mean, it's amazing just what a, a morning do, you know, in August. That's you know, you didn't get rain for two weeks, but you got some you know, pretty nice uh, dewy mornings and uh, yep. how much, how much moisture will hold down in that shade, you know, till one, yep. two o'clock in the afternoon, you know, there might still be moisture under there just from the, the evenings do that's yeah. enough to just sustain yeah. a crop right there. You know, um, yeah, that's so. a good point. Very good point there. there I think it was Grant Woods that did that. He did that uh, temperature gauge under his crimped, uh, um rice you know the rice stems and it was i don't remember what it was but it was a significant difference from soil temp between bare soil and the soil temp under the crimped you know the crimped uh rye stems it was in and you know just that in itself is, is saving a lot of moisture so i think that was close to 20 all. degrees i believe yep yeah it was it was somewhere in that neighborhood it was significant so, but otherwise, you know, bare soil is just going to sit there and begin to bake away. So. Lincoln, you got any, have you sold any uh, packers to anybody in elk country? Um, I, I have, um, probably not, not a significant amount, but yeah, definitely I sent them to Colorado, um, um, Wyoming, Montana, um, I did, I actually sold a couple to, uh, um, 
Yeah, in the in the actual in the Denver area, a couple of guys they they you know they own property out in the in the elk country, and they bought them and they're putting in plots for elk. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I got a they, I got a I got a customer up in Atlanta, Michigan, that we're gonna. Um, you know, he's having he's having me put together a um, an equipment list. You know, for him mm-hmm. on his on his property, and so that's. Um, uh, we're we're waiting for one of the first roller crimpers. So get to if Jared <laughs> nice. if Jared if Jared gets the first one, I get the second and third. <laughs> um, All right, deal. And and probably fourth. So I got a guy just um, I just wrote a plan for a guy in Sand Lake, which is just a few miles north of you. Um, yeah, yeah. Literally. From your office, your office actually, yeah. Yep. But, um, and they're just get they got really sandy soils and um, mm-hmm. they're just getting started uh, with their food plot plans with them and so uh, your packer uh, crimper was on the equipment list for there too so um, I, cool. need, I need I need a few of the first ones. Yep, we're gonna. We're, <laughs> it's it's gonna be you know, and and I I can't tell you probably I bet you half the phone calls that I've received in in the last probably thirty days you know three weeks have been asking about you know the the specifics of the crimper so um, it's gonna it's gonna go and you know that's the other thing with with the with the crimper and and you know the price point is going to be, you know, significantly less than, than, you know, what you, the, the big, you know, the, the these giant crimpers. I mean, I had a, I had a guy, you know, spent $5,000 on one and, uh, he, he had, you know, he, he was, a, he also, yeah, he also bought a Packer Max, but an eight footer, but, uh, he was actually, um, ganging them together and crimping and then, had a cedar going and then was pack, you know, packing it right behind it. <laughs> so, but you know, you're going to be able to get a, a, and it's, you know, it's a much smaller scale. These aren't going to be for, you know, for 10 acre, you know, 10 or 12 acre plots. I mean, you could still do it, but it'll take you a minute, but um, you know, these, it's going to be on the four foot HD model and you know, these, these two, two, I'm going to say two acres and less, it's going to really shine on those. And, you know, I, I would say at the end of the day, 90% of all food plots are two acres or less. So, I mean, obviously you'll get some larger ones, but I would say that the, the average Joe is going to plant two acres or less, and that's where these are really going to shine. So, and the yeah, average Joe is going to be able to afford them, <laughs> you know, because yeah. they're not going to be five grand. So, and I can ship them, you know, I mean, I can ship even, even, if all works out and I can come in under the, my, my, you know, my FedEx ground weight, um, you know, I'll be able to ship them, you know, the, the HD with a crimper would come in what four boxes. And, uh, but, uh, we're, we're still able to, to ship them relatively inexpensively because of the volume that we're doing now with FedEx. It's, you know, we're getting, um, discounts and that helps, you know, and, and, um, trying to keep the point, price point, you know, at a reasonable cost. So, yep. That's, so that's yeah, awesome. keep keep the keep keep the hammer down, Chad. We'll keep keep getting the orders. We'll be sure. golden, man. <laughs> yeah, we we try, we try. Yeah, it, I'm excited about it. It's going to be cool. It's going to be real cool. And we need to use one on our property too, because I mean, we're you know we're extremely sandy and. And, uh, you know, we're constantly trying to build that organic material and, and, uh, you know, it's just, that's just all beneficial to the, to the soil building it from the top down. So. Now, Chad, speaking of, uh, your customers, I know you had a nice listing on, on our Facebook, on your Facebook recently for a 40 acre parcel. Did you end up getting that sold? Uh, yeah, we did. We just uh, got the contract signed yesterday, as a matter of fact. Um, oh, nice. That, Congrats. Yeah, thank you. That and a, and a backup offer. Um, I got that wrapped up uh, yesterday. And, and so we're, yeah, hmm. we're shoot, shooting for, oh, an end of January closing, I guess, on that. It's, um, 
um, the lenders, you know, the, the real estate is so hot right now. Um, appraisers and uh, lenders and title companies and everything is, you know, we used to be able to maybe get things probably wrapped up in 30 days. It's, it's pushing 60 days now. And um, so, yeah, there's a lot of real estate moving the phone. Typically, you know, this is very common um, this time of year for the phone to ring a lot because uh, the hunting seasons are winding down or the bulk, you know, the bulk of it is. Uh, so early December is always um, a big time for buyers and sellers. You know, well, you get a seller calling you saying, you know what, I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, we're going to move on to a bigger parcel or, you know, or we're moving to the other side of the state, you know, kind of thing. So they've hunted it for their last season and then they're going to, you know, move on. And then, then I'll get the buyers calling, you know, saying, well, I'm tired of hunting with my, my cousin and my uncle, you know, <laughs> and I need my own space hmm. and, or it's, I'm tired of, you know, getting shot at on public land. <laughs> so I need my, yep. my, uh, my own property. And so, um, yeah, well, that kind of speaks to you've got a backup or you've got a backup offer on that property and that kind of speaks for itself as to where the market's at you got a guy right. sitting there waiting in the wings in case in case that property in case that offer falls through you know that's that's awesome <laughs> yeah i've been i've been very fortunate that i get a lot of uh high dollar listings half a million and above you know, and those are great, you know, it's, it's fun, uh, to work on those and, and market them, but you know, they, it, it's obviously it takes the right buyer for those, you know, the buying pool is so much smaller. Um, mm -hmm. I, I take these 20 and 30 and 40 acre parcels. Um, uh, so I've, I've had no less than 50 phone calls, um, on this Saginaw County, uh, 39 acres, you know, it's priced under $120,000. And so it's, you know, the payment on that's only a few hundred bucks a month. So it's, you know, it's very affordable for basically everybody. Um, and tax, taxes aren't going to break the bank. And you know, that's one thing that you told me right when I started in this, you know, uh, selling with you guys is, you know, you're, you're going to, your bread and butter is going to be your 40 acres and 20 acre parcels. And, and yeah, it's nice to have those big ones, but, but your lion's share is going to be the, you know, the 40 and 20s or the 20s and 40s and and in that neighborhood. Yep. Yeah, and they're, um, you know, everybody wants to um, do their own little habitat work, you know, and, and try to produce something on their own little parcels and stuff. And so it's, um, you know, uh, the writing plans for these guys, you know, goes hand in hand kind of with the, uh, you know, selling them the property. And so I'm starting, I've been offering, you know, um, a, a habit. I, this is going to go against Jared, but I was here first. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just edit you out. It's fine. I'm just, I'll just edit you out. It's very easy. Right. You know, uh, you know, I, uh, for a certain, a certain dollar amount parcel, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll write the habitat plan for free, you know. Um, well, that's a good idea actually. Um, and, um, so a lot of people don't even, it's, it's shocking. Um, you know, we were this, the one I just sold, you know, we walked it 20 times or so in the last, uh, you know, a couple of weeks and, and the, the seller had done food plot work and put in a trail system and had licking branches um, with uh, rope and with uh, grape vines. And he had done a bunch of hinge cutting to screen uh, you know, the neighbors and his own access paths. Cause you know, let's be honest, these, a 40 acre parcel, this thing was, you know, a half mile long and it's only a, uh, you know, a few hundred yards wide. Um, so your neighbors on, you know, either side of that long stretch are right there. And so it's, it's really important for that screening and the hinge cutting. And, um, I couldn't believe all the people that I was showing this property to that had never heard of, screening and never heard of hinge cutting and had never heard of, uh, you know, steering, tra steering trails and, um, you know, had even had guys asking about, you know, what's, what's that clearing? And they were, um, guys, a lot of guys were even little, 
didn't really know even much about food plots and you know to guys like us that's like you know how do you not know about all those things but it's the <laughs> you live it under a rock or what <laughs> yeah, it's the world that we live in and not everybody you mm-hmm. know lives in that and that's why this yeah. this podcast is reaching you know so many people and it's so important because we you know you, you, you i was blessed to be exposed to you know habitat work and in wildlife conservation, you know, back in the, in the eighties when I was, you know, 10, 12 years old by my father, you know, <laughs> nice. but so not, every, not everybody has that luxury. And, um, right. So anyway, I guess we really got off on a tangent there, but, um, no, the, yeah, the real estate stuff is doing the Brian knows has heard me enough. I can, I can do that every once in a while. Um, uh, <laughs> oh, we welcome so, it. You know, we like it. Yeah, I just end up talking hey. about, you know, something crazy, but. That's okay. Yeah. So, no, real estate's been good. It's been fun, you know, especially just cranking. I was able to basically hunt, you know, a lot with my son and friends, you know, this October and November and didn't have a lot of real estate stuff going on. And then once about Thanksgiving hit, it, you know, it's really started opening up, so. Um, I was able to make a couple trips to Ohio myself and um going to be hunting this weekend with my son. Uh, he's going to, his 11th birthday is on Monday. So uh, we're going to take him and one of his buddies. We're going to go camp out on our property for the weekend and try to try to shoot a couple does. And, um, and then that's, that'll fill up, uh, uh, you know, my goal is about 200 pounds of venison a year is what we would go through. So um, I need to get a couple more uh, to get to that point, and then we'll move on to ice fishing. Mm-hmm. Very nice. Now, Chad, you mentioned the market being hot right now. Walk us through that, and in, uh, in particular with the the types of property that our listeners are looking for, and maybe touch on, you know, why the market's hot and and maybe there's a lot of listeners out there that don't own their own property yet but they're thinking about it and and maybe uh walk them through what this market looks like for them so you know recreational land is um it has its pockets of, of where it's still pretty affordable and then there's you know there's areas where it's getting pretty expensive um, but, uh, you know, if we just talk about Michigan, you know, you can go into, um, Clinton County, you know, where I was born and raised and still live and sell a lot of land at, uh, recreational land. That's probably the highest, um, the highest value recreation land in the state of Michigan, I'd say right now is, is wow. Clinton, Clinton County. Um, there's just the supply and it's just strictly supply and demand. Um, the school district over here that I grew up in, Puamo, Westphalia, uh, it's a highly, you know, it's, it's nationally uh, recognized school district. And so, you know, there's so many people that move into this community and, uh, you know, looking for land there. So it's not uncommon to sell recreation land for between five and $6,500 an acre. Wow. Um, you know, in the western side of Clinton County. Um, the one I just sold in Saginaw County, um, less, just a hair less than $3,000 an acre. So it, it just, you know, and you can go down into Hillsdale County, which, you know, Hillsdale, Jackson, Lenaway, right, is going to be your top, and Calhoun is your top three to four counties for, say, uh, Boone and Crockett, Pope and Young, and Commemorative Bucks of Michigan uh, record books, you know, and th- those counties are only bringing three to 4,000 an acre down through there. Uh, I just, well, uh, two months ago s- sold a parcel in Lenaway County, you know, at $3,600 an acre. Um, and that seller was an appraiser and um, didn't think that we I was going to get that. You know, he thought I was asking, tell, you know, advising him uh of a listing price too high you know and he says well let's try it and you know we got him more than what he thought he'd get and you know and he deals in appraisals every day so that shows you the supply and demands up there um 
uh, but buyers are still smart. You know, they're not paying uh, way over, you know, asking price um, or what they may feel, you know, is, is a reasonable price. Um, uh, but if I, I, I honestly don't know where everybody's money is coming from. Um, you know, I try to ask people here and there, you know, why, you know, why are you buying now or why at this point? And, um, it, I don't, you know, I got guys that are, um, heating, heating, heating and cooling, uh, business. I got guys that are engineers. I got guys that are just retiring and I'm going to pull some, uh, money out of their, uh, you know, retirements and 401ks and stuff. And I guess people are, everybody's always known that it's, you know, land is a great investment, but I think if you really watch, like, I wish I could have bought every acre I could get my hands on when I was 20 years old. <laughs> right. You oh, know, yeah. look what, right. I mean, properties, you know, where I grew up, uh, land in the mid nineties was 2000 an acre. Now, now it's being sold for six and seven. Um, so it's just an unbelievably good investment you know, you're never going to lose money. So if you can afford it, you need to do it. Um, I, that's just the way it is. If you can afford it, you need to do it. Look how much money we spend yeah. on leasing a car, buying a truck, you know, a $70,000 brand new truck that, you know, two years later, it's worth half that. Yep. Yeah. You know, your land Priorities. Value. Priorities. Yep. Well, I just, you know, I'll use this last guy as an example. Um, I showed him this parcel the other day and he showed up in a 1994 Chevy extended cab truck, you know, and that's, uh, he pointed at that truck and he says, well, that truck is basically why I can almost pay cash for, you know, this land. Wow, um, right. you know, I've gone through 10 vehicles since 1994, you know, and he's, yep. he's, uh, he's on the same one and, um, uh, look at the money he saved, uh, but um, yeah, so the I, I don't know why people are so willingly spending money. Um, they just are, I guess. That's about all I can say. And uh, I wish we had yeah. wish we had more sellers because uh, I've probably got 20, 20 buyers, you know, for every decent parcel of land. And that's a uh, you know, if you're looking at Zillow. Right now, you know, that's what I hear from a lot. You know, a lot of guys are looking at Zillow and Realtor.com and Landwatch.com is a big one or Lands of America. Yeah, that's where you I know, found and, mine actually, yep. And so, you know, guys are watching that stuff and, and um, you know, you can set up set up search parameters where, you know, you get emails and when cert certain properties come up for sale and, um they're just, uh, I wish we, I, I, I don't know why so many people are holding, you know, normally you, a lot of times you drive around the countryside, right? You see a lot more for sale signs and they're just, they aren't out there like they, uh, like they used to be. But, you know, I, I normally have 10 or 12 listings I carry usually at a time. Um, right now I've got one. And so it's because every time that we get one, it's sold within a month's time. And so I'm, we're just never, I'm never building up any kind of inventory, um, which is fine with me, you know, to keep, keep rolling them over. Yeah. And I mean, if anybody is looking to, looking to sell, um, whether, you know, you're a partner of the show or not, I'm going to, I'm going to point them to either you or Lincoln, you know, you guys are, are friends of mine, you're, you're good guys and you guys sell stuff very quickly. So whether it's, uh, your amazing realtor skills or in combination with, with the market, you know, just it's, it's hot right now. And I yeah. mean, I want to sell my 15 and buy, buy something bigger. You know, I really, really do. After, after hunting this year, I had a lot of things go wrong and I just need a little more room. Um, don't always feel like that. You know, I, I mm -hmm. kill, kill plenty of deer out there and have some great hunts, but this year it's just been a little tough and it got me thinking, but at the same time, like we were talking about earlier with, you know, equity and homes before we were recording, you, you sell yours. What do you, you know, what are you going to buy? Everything's bought up. Yeah. 
So you well, have to almost that's have another thing. spot to sit and hunt right now in the meantime while you wait for your next property, right? Or what do you recommend there, right. Link? All right. Well, it's just, it's right now, um, you know, I've got, so, and I was just talking to the gentleman, we're going to look, I'm taking a client to look at a property on Tuesday. And I was talking to that agent, the listing agent, and, you know, we were talking and there's, there's 1500, uh, real estate agents in the greater Grand Rapids area. And oh, there was, oh, man. Uh, yeah, and it's and there's there's, I mean the, the there's just no listings right now. Like because we, and if you do get a listing, I mean they're gone immediately. Like my wife and I are looking for a, a new home right now, and I mean if you're not if you don't and it's and if you're if you're having to do financing, if you don't have a cash offer, I mean it makes it really difficult, and. Uh, it's just a hot market right now. The homes and, you know, and real estate. And if you have, uh, or properties, and if you have, if you have uh, properties with a home on it, you know, it just, it seems like that's even, even a hotter commodity right now. But, well, let me, let me ask you guys a question because I've got, um, to hijack your question to Lincoln just a little bit. So, because, you know, we're having to be creative here a little bit and uh, maybe look at some land that, um, you know, maybe isn't isn't high productive farmland that you could take a blank 20 acres, right? Strictly farmland. So, and turn that into something, right? Um, wildlife, hunting-wise. Um, I got a, a farm that we are... Uh, in discussions with the family about putting up for sale and it's um, almost 200 acres um, and but it's out of the 180 of it's tillable um, it's it's not not highly productive farmland um, it's gonna probably bring 45 four to five thousand dollars an acre um it, would you guys would you guys buy a blank slate at 4500 bucks an acre if you got 20 to 25 30 acres and completely just build it your wildlife habitat from scratch is that too much money to spend uh to to start from scratch from a hunting aspect or would you look at it like, Hey, here's my blank slate. I can build whatever I want. Jared. So I would prefer to start out with timber over, over low quality, uh, open ground just for cover, just for cover and value. Um, you get at least some money out of the timber when I clear a lot of it, right. And pay some of that, that nut off that down payment off or, um, your loan off on that. Um, that would be my first prep or, uh, preparation there or preferred item. But what I would, I'm not scared of that at all though. Um, I would, I would enroll in a CRP program and start getting paid on that ground and creating cover at the same time. Um, very quickly and, and i would yeah I, 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 I wouldn't but it's still a lot of it's a lot of money to buy to buy something it's a lot of money though so that's, that's a tough one chad um you could easily make it into what you want though in terms of cover and food with cave and rock switch or crp and and food plots and low pressure i'm not afraid of that at all it's just um you're paying top dollar for something that's not top dollar it would be would be what worries me. You have to buy right. You know what I mean? So it's, you know, the, in real estate, you know, the, so I just looked at a 10 acre parcel today. Um, so I'm going to completely go hang a left turn here, Brian. <laughs> um, <laughs> Wait, hold on, it. hold on. Let's, let's hear Brian's answer on that. Yeah. First. Yeah. I mean, with that, with the information you gave me, I would be inclined 
to pass, but it depends on, you know, the county, what the, what the deer herds like, what the, what the bucks are capable of, you know, you might be willing to pay a little more if, if the area is known for, for growing bigger bucks. Um, and, and it depends on, you know, the, um, the going rate. I mean, if that, if, if really good land's going for five, 6,000 an acre and you're, and you're down to 4,500, you know, it's, it's all relative, but as far as habitat goes, I'm with Jared. I mean, I, I'm not afraid of open ground. Blank slates are great. You have to be willing to have the time. Uh, if you're 70 years old, you know, hopefully you're in really good health if you're going to invest 10 years in the, in the developing an open field, but uh, it can be done. I've seen guys do it time and time again. Yeah, I think, I think, um, I, the the gentleman that we're uh, that I'm showing property to uh, on Tuesday, um, his dream is to buy a golf course and turn it into a habitat project. Oh yeah, sure. for sure. You know, you know, he's just like I just he just you know it would just be absolutely fantastic. You you could do so many things and and uh, but like like you know like Brian just said you, you know you you have to. That's one thing that I think all of us are learning in habitat, and and I've learned this. You got to be patient because you don't normally see the fruits of your labor right away. Sometimes you do, but but not always. It's it's you know it takes time to develop projects and and you know for things to to come around. Um, didn't Corey? Um, you just had Corey on here a while back, I think, didn't you? Corey? Uh, yeah, uh, Francis. Which is Francis, yeah. Uh didn't he kind of did that? Didn't he? He started with pretty much a blank slate, didn't he? He, was, he had a lot of open ground. Yeah, he pretty much I, has taken out all of his tillable. Yeah, his I mean, his property is amazing. I mean, have you seen the the aerial of that? Oh, yeah, I, yeah, I got to spend some time out there doing a little hunting last year uh for a doe hunt and uh I was out there this mm-hmm. year with my son. For another tour out there yeah he's he uh it, it can be done he's he's planted 1500 trees um he, yeah, he's taken mm-hmm. all that all that open field and, and turn it into deer habitat and um it's gonna pay off for him in, in in big ways for sure yeah yeah definitely definitely so i mean just just you know and, and just for instance this property we're looking at on tuesday is is just under five thousand an acre you know, so, and that's, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a blend of marsh, uh, timber and open, you know, and I don't think there's any quote unquote tillable, but there's some open areas where food plots could be either can be or are planted. And, um, you know, and that's, that's just under 5,000 an acre. Or so in comparison. Yeah. I just really think that we're, you know, we're 5,000 seems to be, um what i so i'm seeing stuff where i hunt in eastern ohio you know stuff is 35 to 45 over there and um a lot of stuff in southern michigan is hunting land is 35 to 45 um then you get into some of these upper properties where the high demand is high you know where i'm seeing five to to six um Mm -hmm. you know those i think you we talk uh, when Brian and Jared are well, millionaires off this podcast in 10 years, right, you know, right. there's, we're going to be talking about $10,000 an acre hunting land. I just, right. you know, that's probably I mean, 20 years yeah. down the road, but I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, <lots> of- <laughs> it's doubled. It's doubled in the last 20 years. Easy. Yeah. I well, think it's it more is, than an example. Yeah, I agree. So my father's owned, you know, our property in Nuego, uh, since 1978, they bought it for $40,000. It's 160 acres. Wow. And we, when we recently, yeah, when we, we recently were, were very highly considering uh, buying some property in Southern Michigan and we were going to list it for 400, you know, 400,000. So, I mean, I know 1978 is a long time ago, but I mean, you know, it's, it's just, 
that's that's the, the how real estate is just has gone nuts and and you know the, I love the saying you know land they're not making any more of it so yep. you know our population you know the human population just keeps growing you know right and Earth isn't <laughs> so right. you know right. that's again the supply and demand is going to drive and good paying jobs you know Mich Grand Rapids mm -hmm. um, the auto you know has got it's one of the fastest growing communities in the United States. Um, the automotive yeah. automotive industry has come back, you know, so the engineers and the, the line workers and stuff like that, you know, all that stuff is, is going well again. Um, so For just now. healthcare workers are <laughs> sure. big time in, in Grand, yeah, in the Grand Rapids area, the metro area, you know, the healthcare has, has just skyrocketed. There's, everybody's in healthcare making, you know, making a good living. So, yeah. You know, in comparison, um, you know, now with this, this new real tree United country, uh, hunting properties affiliation, I'm getting to know, uh, land agents all around the United States and especially like the Kansas and Missouri and Colorado, Mississippi, Louisiana, Florida, you know, and they're, you can buy some really good hunting land in Missouri, you know, for 2000 an acre. Um, you can go same thing that Mississippi, I think Louisiana type stuff is they're way below what Michigan is, you know? And I, so again, mm -hmm. it's just, it's the supply and demand. Um, yeah. we, we've got high human populations up here with them. The Grand Rapids, Lansing, Detroit, you know, Brighton, I mean, pretty much now, Jared, right? Howell and Brighton all kind of blends into Detroit, isn't it? Like it's so built, it's so built up in, um, yeah. Yeah. It's, know. uh, I mean, we're, we're 45, 50 minutes out of, out of Detroit, but if you're going to try to find vacant land between here and, and there, I think you have to maybe start at South line and start working your way West. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty built up and, and you talk about 5,000 an acre, you buy 10, 20, 30 acres that way. You're talking 10 an acre all day. Um, sure. Yeah. It's just, uh, well, that's, the other, that's the other thing is Michigan is broken up into such, you know, a, a lot of smaller parcels and, yeah, it um, is. you know, what you find and what, or at least what I've seen down in, you know, Missouri, Ohio, Southern Ohio, you know, you get, um, Illinois, you know, even like our, our, where our lease in Hancock is, you got a lot of bigger parcels. Um, you know, around here, they're, just, you know, there's a, a, a 160 is not, they don't grow on trees. So, and that's, you know, put it in perspective, that's only a half mile square. So, yeah. Jared, you'll appreciate this one, Jared. Um, not too far from you. Um, uh, sometime this week yet, I'm going to be going to look at a 700 acre contiguous uh, property uh, not too far from the uh, outlet mall there in Howell um, to do uh, just to, to take over the habitat work on, on that farm. Wow. And, uh, and I didn't even know a property that size existed anymore, you know, over there. It's literally, it's literally only a few miles off of 96 and, you know, just near the outlet mall and all the, you know, that's a bedroom community basically for Detroit now, right? You're like, you say yeah. you're, you're less than an hour. And so I'm really excited to get on this property. It's a, you know, broke up farmland with swamps and some high ground, low ground ridges, um, odd field sizes and stuff like that. So I'm really excited to get over there and and start working on the habitat over there. But, uh, you know, it's, you look at it from an aerial and it's just, it's surrounded by five and seven, eight acre parcels, you know, with these big houses on it with the long driveways and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, this farm's probably worth, God, I don't even want to know, you know, she, it's, I'm not looking at it for real estate. You know, we're just, I'm going to be taking over the duties of, um, uh, habitat manager, I guess. And, um, but I can't imagine what that thing would go for, um, you know, in a real estate market. Cause it's literally surrounded by housing developments and, and large, you know, 10, 20 acre parcels with 
nice homes on it. But I'll keep you. I'll keep you yeah. posted when that one goes for sale, Jared. You we'll probably right. Get, we'll get you on that one. Right. Unfortunately, yeah. that probably I'll, I'll buy the, the forty right in the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they probably split it up and piece it off and and develop it. <laughs> Yeah, so everybody that, else is doing. Seven hundred acres managing managing. I can't imagine managing seven hundred acres. I, I mean, well, one hundred and sixty is just about a full time job. There's always something to do. It's it's crazy. I could imagine that's going to be a big undertaking. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I can. Just, I can't. It, yeah, you got cow, it. This this will. This old man, it needs some heavy equipment to run. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah, hoping they will. cab, I'm air conditioning. I'm hoping, they want to, I'm hoping they want to trade for some uh, hunting rights, as, you know. There you go. That would yeah. be terrible. Help them keep their costs Yeah, the Real Tree, Real Tree United uh, real estate uh, hunting property. Oh, I thought you were going to say team. Habitat podcast. Yeah, a team. <laughs> right. We can stay at the we can stay at the Holiday Inn that's across the road from it. <laughs> right. <laughs> now there's not a lot of big parcels like that left around here. Um, there's some there's some farmers out that way that have, you know, farmed that ground for a long time and obviously still in their family and there's street names named after them because they built a street way back when and, mm. and there's yeah that's that's one of those things like a lot of guys like us or or a lot of our listeners probably aren't gonna. Uh, you know have have a couple million bucks lying around and go spend on that but i wish i did that'd be amazing um, right. I, yeah, be sweet. That's, that sounds like a cool opportunity chad let me know how that goes i'll go walk it with you i'd love to see it yeah sure we might, might need some sweat equity out of you there you go right. there you go so brian well, what what are, are you gonna wrap things up here jared no see. go ahead i was just gonna ask what your other um you had another uh uh, example you were going to throw at us about 10 acres or something like that. Oh, sure. Well, you know, we're I, I'm brainstorming here with this, you know, this farm, that's almost a, you know, a hundred percent tillable. Um, so, you know, the, the phrase highest and best use, um, is used in real estate and it's, um, so this, this property that I just went and looked at, I looked at it two years ago and it was just swamp up front and uh, high ground in the back and there was no no access really to get to that back other than kind of an old, um, you know, a little old two track that was cut through the cattails, you know, a long time ago. Um, she wasn't quite ready to put it on the market and uh, since then, uh, it, it was all overgrown with autumn olive and um, you just could, you couldn't even get around the property basically you know so it was hard to envision anything and, and so at that point it was it was a deer hunting property right that was its best use at that point well they did a little upgrading to the the road um, that was there and uh, got to the back of the property and then and cleared I know this is going to break some people's hearts but they cleared a lot of the autumn olive um opened the property up and you know now you can in and there's a hot you know a high spot in the back that would be um a perfect spot for a home so now this property's highest and best use just changed right we've got a we've got a little bit of a driveway um to get to is the this back a 10 acre it's, property or which what, yep. what size is, okay, 10 acre, okay yeah this is 10 so you know, now it went from probably a $60,000, you know, hunting property um, in Ingham County, um, not too far outside of Lansing, you know, to probably now it's worth over $100,000 just because the access was opened up and now you can, you can visually see where a house could go, you know, because some of the understory was taken out. They actually um, cleaned up the shoreline um, on uh, one of the wetlands uh, to where when I was there the first time, I was like, you couldn't even hardly see it. And now they got rid of a bunch of the brush along the edge um, and, and actually, you know, made it to where it's almost like a usable little pond now. 
um, and they put a little dock along the edge. And so it, how this relates to habitat is, you know, some sweat equity um, is really changed this property and uh, added a ton of value where to, they probably put $5,000 uh, maybe in materials and sweat equity into the property, but it's, it probably added 30 to 40, you know, uh, to a sales price. So guys like you, Jared, that have got that small 15, you know, and then guys that are buying the 20 and 12s and 30s, because that's what they can afford. Don't forget about putting in your culvert at the road in the nice gate, right? In some crushed concrete little driveway to get into it with a parking spot um, and a couple food plots and, and planting some pear and apple trees and caging them real nice and have them have a Packer Max hanging, you know, from the, uh, <laughs> in, in the, in the corner and some nice food plots. And, um, yep. You know, at, think about some of these things that you're doing because you think it's helping your hunting but you're also helping the value of the property too. If you wanted to turn and decide to sell, um, you know, just to, the way the property presents itself is a, is a huge, a huge benefit. Yeah, that's, a, well, you know. that's an excellent point. Excellent point. Because that, that gets overlooked a lot. It just, it shows that you, you know, you care about the property and that you're taking care of it. Um, and that you're just not a lazy ass, you know, just trying to shoot a couple deer off the property and, oh, I'm going to sell it now and try to make 10 grand, you know, while you, right. you know, you got some things uh, going with the property to benefit and trail cam picks, you know, this, this 39 acre parcel, you know, my seller did a fantastic job of uh, trail cam placement and uh, taking inventory of the deer that were there. Um, and that's, you know, let's be honest, I've, most guys, you know, the first thing they want to say it, when a property comes up for sale, they want to say, well, you know, you got any trail cam pictures, you got any kill photos, you know, what, what have right. they been killing? What are they, that's what guys want to see. And, uh, mm -hmm. and the seller, you know, did a good job with it, the Saginaw 39 acres. And, and that's, you know, that when I first posted those trail cam pictures and said you know coming soon i mean that facebook post just that thing just like lincoln was talking about the organic you know people just started commenting and tagging each other on it and you know from maybe only getting you know 10 or 15 likes and a few comments i mean this thing had 50 60 likes and you know uh, 30 comments and and i had you know, 10 calls the, the next day. Um, so keep an, you know, even if, if you're th even remotely thinking about selling your property, do a really good job with trail cam and harvest photos, mm -hmm. um, building a story, build a story to the property. And then, um, you know, that, that's going to help it sell so much. Um, because I'll get a lot of guys, if we have a parcel for sale, that's, you know, there's a lot of undocumented um, stuff. You know, there isn't much history on the property. There's been no habitat improvements. It's just a, you know, it's just a chunk of ground. I get so many people that say, well, would the seller, you know, lease it to me? Can I hunt it for a year, you know, for right. two thousand, a couple thousand bucks so I can see you know, so I can see what the neighbors are like, so I can see, you know, how the deer move, so I can see if there's any big bucks out here. Can I put trail cams out here? You know, um, there's just a lot of unknowns when you really, when you don't have uh, things documented. So, um, good point. you know, guys out there that are, uh, you know, a lot of guys listen to this podcast, uh, you know, I'm sure of, of probably you know, they own their own property or, you know, they're leasing it and stuff. That's why they're trying to get an education about habitat. So, you know, think about those things uh, as you're going through your years and, and, and creating a story about the property. And um, it's, you know, some small investments and a few things can really pay off in the long run. 
Yeah, even like adding a, a perk test or um like, like you said, some harvest pictures and, and just uh yeah, I'd I'd thought about that. I I think that's a great point to to get across. Um uh, how does hinge cutting <laughs> fit into that? You mean whether or not it's good or not? No, I just I didn't know. People people probably don't want to see a bunch of trees laid over, but at the same time, if they see your success from the property that or what you're producing, uh, I think that would negate a couple of trees on their side. You're a glutton for punishment, man. Here comes the hate mail. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's 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 stir it up. Well, let's stir the pot up here. So, um, I'll keep referring back to this 39 acres again, but you know this. So this this property had a. Um, a bulldoze trail, you know, you could drive a truck around it, um, side by side or your Chevy truck all completely around the outside. And so that's what we would walk when I was showing it to the clients. Um, and I didn't tell anybody this until we got around to the other side of the property. Um, but we'd go three quarters of the way around the property. And then that two track led into a food plot that was in the middle of the property. But that food plot led up to where we walked into the property initially. And those, when you walked into the property initially, you could not see that food plot. We were within 25 yards of it. Nice. But he had mm. taken he had taken that whole south edge and hinge cut probably 20 to 25 acres. Oh, wow. Right. right I'm sorry, 20 to 25 yards. Gotcha. Um, so starting right from the edge of the two track, going into the interior of the property, all along where that food plot was. And we, you know, nobody, nobody ever noticed the food plot. And again, so we'd take them all the way around the property, come into the middle of the food plot. We'd walk into that side and I'd ask them, I said, do you know where you, where you were, you know, 20 minutes ago? I said, you were right over there, 20, you know, 25 yards away. I'd point through the hinge cut and they had no clue that that food plot was there. And so, you know, there's, I don't know, in, in a completely wooded parcel, I don't know what else you can do to create that environment. Right. Right. You know, mm -hmm. on, a, on a small parcel that guys can afford, you've got to do some of these things or in two hunts you'll have blown the whole property the deer off the whole property and you'll your your season will be done and you'll want to turn them and, and sell the property you know uh correct so yeah you know uh there's i think there's a there's a there's a big difference between hinge cutting with a purpose and hin and just hinge cutting and i think that's oh, where a sure. lot of guys get frustrated is you know um, or, or don't see the benefit in it. And if they're, if you're just hinge cutting to hinge cut, you know, I, I don't, I don't love that, but if you're hinge no. cutting with a purpose, um, you know, like Chad is saying, then, then, you know, I, like, like exactly that you, what else are you supposed to do to, uh, I call it, you know, um, expand your property, you know, um, you know, we just, we just had our property up North, the, the 160 logged and I am super excited about it because, you know, we had a bunch of mature red pine and I had to, I had, I had to do some hinge cutting amongst that red pine because, you know, some of the maple and whatnot, because otherwise you're standing there and you can see 300 yards. Well, right. our forester was all pissed off at me because he said, you're wrecking the trees. I go, <laughs> Yeah, but what what else are we supposed to do? You know, I mean, how are you supposed to thicken, you know, standing red pine without doing some hinge cutting? You know, I had no choice. So now we've harvested it and, you know, and, and moved on to that. But, but uh, you know, if there's some purpose involved in hinge cutting. I think that's the, the key. Yeah, just it's with any with any habitat management tool we use or, or talk about or. Um or refer to it's always what are your goals right uh i've talked mm -hmm. about this before and and my forester he's not a fan of it either uh but he understands my goals are for deer not to not to sell the property or not to 
you know, grow trees and in, in terms of uh, logging later on down the road is pretty, it's, it's to hide my access from where I park to where I get to my tree stand. And uh, he understood that. And, you know, it just depends on what your goals are. So Lincoln, I totally agree with you there. And, and Chad, that's a perfect example of how that works um, on the edge of a food plot or whether you're hinge cutting, or whether you're opening up the canopy with, with TSI or, or uh, logging, I mean, get that sunlight to the floor and, and hopefully you'll have some side cover and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But hinge cutting does work well for that. Um, it's a perfect, perfect segue into what I want to talk about next. Uh, what do you guys have on the docket for, for uh, habitat work the next, you know, month to, to two, three months? What do you guys, you guys sharpen up the chainsaws or, or Lincoln, what do you got going on over at, at your property? You said you just logged a bunch. Yeah, we just had we just had a thousand red pine taken off the property, so I'm kind of oh, I'm kind of in a holding pattern until I see you know what kind of what happens in you know in spring green up and see how things you know react. And um, you know, a lot of my habitat work in the winter is you know the, we we get a fair amount of snow typically on our property because we get a lot of lake effect plus we're you know we're we're just a, above that northern quadrant of the snow band and uh you know so i i typically um you know this time of year i i'm just i'm kind of in a holding especially this year because of having a log i'm in a holding pattern so um till we till we kind of get a get an idea and you know they didn't finish cutting until september 17th i think so i haven't i mean i haven't even walked the, the entire property i'm looking forward to shed season because then i can get in there and uh, you know go and access some of the areas where you know we don't we don't go into and just kind of see what it looks like <laughs> you know so because i mean you know, like I said, hunting season stuff. I mean, we're not going to go in there. And, you know, we just have the, the equipment and stuff pulled out of there. We certainly weren't going to go in there and raise a bunch of cane looking around. So, so that's kind of where I'm at right now with ours. So, are, do you, are you going to have to do any cleanup um, after the loggers are out of there in terms of cutting new paths for either access or for the deer? Or are they cleaning up a lot of for you? Or how's that look? So I should have my logger's name and stuff here, and I don't, unfortunately, because I'm here to tell you that guy, that his company did absolutely an amazing job. We had it logged about 15 years ago, and those guys, if they needed to get to a tree, they ran every tree over in the, in, in its way to get to a tree. These guys, I mean, they just, they did such a great job of, of conserving you know sapling you know red pine and sapling just it's they did a great job and they and, and they carried the logs out instead of dragging them you know with a skitter um makes a huge difference on on uh, uh the damage that is done when they when they carry them all they caught them on site in the 10 foot sections you know they stripped the strip the limbs off um and then what they did because we already had a network of, of roads uh, trail system they went through with their dozer and any 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 damage to the roads that they did they fixed um they just they just did it they far exceeded my expectations like my my food plot um i had i don't know seven or eight full mature red pines in it and it, we had already planted the plots and you could they reached in they they went into the plot straight in and they reached out they can reach out 40 feet i think it was with that boom grab the tree cut it and they back straight out and then they 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 stripped the tree out of the food plot and i, I had to top seed one or two sets of tracks going into my plot with rye and they just i mean so the cleanup isn't going to be huge i mean it's there's obviously there's limbs and crap every you know i mean when they strip a, a red pine they leave the tops um yeah but a lot of that is cover right now too so you know we're gonna have a lot of thermal cover because we do have those those tops laying there right now so but uh 
you know, they did they did a great job. So I'm I'm super happy with the job they did. How big a tops are left on those red pines when they cut them off? Or how tall were the trees they were harvesting? Um, they were about uh, the average tree. I think well, they took anything bigger than uh, any red pine that was bigger than I believe eight inches in diameter, all the way up to you know, like you can't wrap your arms around them. Wow. Um, and so there's a big you know because they took a lot of uh, fence post red pines, I guess they call it. Um, and so, you know, there's varying, varying tops, you know, we had sure. some, some hundred footers, you know, that have a pretty, uh, you know, there's a pretty nice top laying there. Um, you know, but uh, again, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of a, it, it may not look beautiful, but <laughs> there's a lot of good cover in this, you know, in the central area where they kind of clear cut it. And, uh, so I mean, there's, there's, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, it's, you know, there's some of those tops are, you know, at the, where they cut them are probably 10 inches in diameter. Okay. You know, so, uh, you know, it just depended on the, on the tree that they took. So. No, that's, um, that's pretty awesome. I, I know I like to leave all the tops. Um, I just left all the tops from my eight acres that was hit and, um, uh, mm-hmm. It's all big side cover at the moment. Uh, there's no pines back there because it's pretty wet, but it's all yeah. big, you know, 10, 15 foot tall side cover for uh, for a while yet. So um, I hear you yeah. there that they bed in and around that already. They're they're holding up against it. They browse next to it. I mean, they just they love that side cover yep. back to the hinge cutting thing and and the tops of the trees yeah. that you have laying there. That's pretty awesome. I couldn't believe yeah, it's, the. It's uh, so we only had, we had just a, a few hard maples taken off our property uh, last winter. And, and this was in a, a park-like setting, you know, of the woods. Mm-hmm. And I could not believe the activity that it was around. There was only like probably four treetops in this uh, probably five acre area. Um, and the four tops were all within you know, a few feet of each other. They were all within like a, you know, a half of a football s- a field size area. And I could not mm-hmm. believe the activity that took place around. Uh, I saw bedding. I saw breeding. I saw feeding. I saw, you know, a buck with a doe, you know, when they're pinned down and, and wanting to get away from everybody laying next to that. Mm-hmm. When there was any kind of... Uh, when the when a group of deer were nervous from something you know they'd trot over and stop next to those tops and then stop and take a look around and um i had a ton of great encounters with really good bucks around those treetops this year so that was a lot of fun yeah just to your point yeah, our, tops, you know yeah well our uh, the forester actually called me um you know, uh, just at the end of the gun season, just to check in, you know, he, Hey, how, you know, we cut pretty close to deer season. How did that affect you guys? And I'm like, well, to be quite honest, I, I didn't notice any difference in our, in our deer sighting. If anything, we saw more deer, you know, um, I, you know, the whole woods smelled like fresh timber, you know, <laughs> and, and I can't imagine that those deer, you know, didn't smell that a mile away and come right. looking to see, you know, see what they could browse on. Cause, and they were in there nipping it, you know, they, of course they ran over some trees, but I mean, you know, uh, so there was some, you know, there was a lot of browse, uh, from, you know, woody browse from treetops and, and, um, you know, so I, th- I think we honestly saw more deer, uh, you know, we shot, we shot three pretty solid eight points this year. And, and uh, I think we ended up shooting six does off the property. And, uh, I shot two does and then, and then, uh, that eight that I got. And, um, you know, so we had, we had a respectable year, you know, considering that, you know, we wreaked absolute havoc right up until like the eighth, the 17th or 18th of, of September. And, uh, you know, our food plots have just been decimated this year. They are, they are hit hard. And that's why we're, <laughs> we've been focusing on some of the, on some taking them a few of the mouths off the table with the does and sure and, uh, and, uh, so, so it's been good 
So, but, Chad, how so, about you? So what, you do, what do you got going on for uh, your plans and goals for the next couple of months here? Um, well, I'm going to take that. Um, you know, so I live on 10 acres, and um, uh, first to start with that, you know, we've been – I've been trying to, to let uh, Mother Nature take over. Uh, we have uh, about, our house sits on about three acres and then we have a, a little county drain that runs behind that three acres that's all wooded and then there's seven acres of tillable behind that. And, um, you know, for the past five years, I've been trying to let Mother Nature take over. I was hoping some more uh, woody brows and um, forbs and stuff would come on um, but they're just not not doing it fast enough uh, for me. You know, we're all instant gratification people nowadays. Um, mm. And so uh, I've got a really good crop of volunteer uh, clover throughout the property that's really uh, doing well for spring uh, fawning cover and food and also uh, brood nesting cover for uh, – we've got a really good population of pheasants ring neck pheasants here oh, wow. because of the neighboring I planted uh, neighbor's property we've got uh, two different neighbors I planted 55 acres of uh, native warm season grasses and full forbs for then so that's holding a lot of deer and, and did you uh, say 55 acres yes yep wow yep it, it wraps around me it wraps around me on two sides and so I'm trying to provide the food you know, because there's a cut the cover they got the cover, but you know there's so much food inside a CRP field too. You know, you got all that a lot of natural stuff just growing. But right. Um, so I guess I'm going to change things up here a little bit. I've got really really heavy soil um, in my white pine and spruce and stuff like that are not coming on like I want them to um, for bedding uh, cover. And so I, I think I'm going to till the whole thing uh, under uh, the spring, and I think I'm just going to go at it with uh, forage sorghum, Egyptian wheat, uh, grain sorghum, and uh, sunflowers. I'm probably going to do that to most of the seven acres. And then uh, – we'll see how that grows. You know, I've got a little bit of a, a drainage that cuts through the middle of that. So uh, that'll get washed out some with some spring and summer rains. And then um, where that's going to wash out, I'll probably seed that with uh, some turnips and brassicas and stuff like that in midsummer. And then I'll probably, uh, you know, I'm probably going to actually crimp and roll some of that sorghum and uh, that'll lay down uh, once that starts to mature, you know, the seed heads will mature and harden and that'll be food. Uh, it's, you know, a little tip. <sighs> Try sorghum for your deer plots. I know we all, a lot of guys use it for screening. Try forage and grain sorghum for deer food. Just do me a favor and try a little bit of it here and there. I bet you'd be surprised the amount of deer activity you'll get in it. Um, I'd suck in that. Yeah, I get yeah, so we much. Actually, we've actually planted it before for, for deer. And, and uh, yeah, and, and we had a lot of wildlife. We had birds and deer and everything else. In the... Yeah, I think it's under – it's under – it's just – it's not talked about at all, right? So um, I'm – pretty heavily involved with uh, a lot of pheasants forever chapters here in Michigan. And, you know, we, we do a lot of seed giveaway. And, and so for, you know, turkeys and pheasants and stuff, it's always been known and used, um, you know, for, for both cover and for food for the birds. But I get a lot of feedback from, you know, guys that are really, they're really deer guys, you know, but they're trying to help the pheasants by providing cover and food for them. And they're like, man, this sorghum stuff really works good for the deer. And um, so, you know, my own observations plus from other people, uh, uh, you know, I'm telling you guys, just, just get some sorghum out on your ground as a food plot. Um, 
And so I'll leave some of that standing and then I'm going to, uh, let's call, I'm going to hinge, I'm going to hinge cut with my crimper, uh, a bunch of sorghum <laughs> and, uh, and I'll, then I'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll go in and uh, seed, you know, some turnips and brassicas and rye and weed in that and uh, see how that, how that would turn out. Um, might be a fun little experiment that we could document for the podcast. Um, and then on our main property, um, our, uh, our family farm, you know, we had, to, I'm, I'm going to expand, I'm going to enhance those treetops um, by doing some uh, hinge cutting around those treetops and uh, create a little bit more uh, security cover uh, around those tops so that uh, one, the deer feels safe, but two, so that I can access um, that little area over. So like I said, it's all park, park-like park effect around it, except for these, you know, if, uh, 40 foot long by 20 foot tall uh, uh, tops. And I just want to enhance those so that uh, I I can get a better access to my stand and, and then also, um, you know, give some more security cover for those deer. And, you know, those tops coming down, they've, uh, they've opened up a lot of food sources that are blossoming uh, because of the sunlight getting down to that ground. And another thing I'm going to do is uh, in that area as well, probably before I hinge cut, we're going to burn uh, the leaf uh, matter the material off the, the soil. Um, and that ought to help uh, rejuvenate uh, the regrowth on that. And that's something I was going to ask you, Lincoln, is, and so were you guys harvested, um, on your timber harvest, was that pretty much all uh, pine that was harvested? Um, it was, it was mostly pine. We took a thousand red pine and then they took, um, basically any, any, uh, I don't know what they call them, uh, log size or veneer size uh, uh, maple. Yeah. So we did have quite a few maple taken too. Um, but <laughs> and to your, to, we we actually I've contacted the Michigan Prescribed Burning Council, and they're going to come out and take a take a, an assessment of uh, some controlled burns on the property. So and assist in that. So. Yeah, that's what I was, you know, um, with with your pine needles, you know, you could have you could have a duff layer of six four to six inches of pine needles through there. You know, and, and if you want if you want regrowth and regeneration of some new species and stuff in there, uh you're gonna have to do some altering of that top. Um and so I was curious if you were thinking about you know, running a fire through that at all. Um, you know, one of yeah, was, we've definitely looked into that for sure. Yeah. That's something that a lot of guys just don't want to deal with. I think, um, you know, it's, well, it gets a little scary. Yeah. I've done a couple of controlled burns on my own and, um, you know, did a lot of reading, a lot of, you know, in perfect conditions and, and uh, we had a little bit of a close call, and I haven't done one since. Sure. And uh, that's why I called the, you know, Yikes. I called the prescribed burn council, and you know they're going to come in with their rangers with the, you know, huge tanks with the high pressure fire hoses and shit, and um, you know, uh, assist in you know in the burn and in you know the breaks and all that, and make sure the conditions are right, and. Cause I just, you know, it, you have to be so freaking careful. I mean, it's, if you don't know what you're doing, don't, don't do it. <laughs> yeah. I agree. So, yeah. I've, but. I've spent, I've spent a bunch of time, you know, on properties. In fact, probably one, not too far from you. Um, um, what's the little town off of Apple Avenue, uh, say between, um, between you and Lake Michigan, there's a little town. Steve Rinella is it's where he's from. Twin Lake. Twin Lake. I yeah. start. I I almost started the largest wildfire in Twin Lake, Michigan, about five years ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, you know, Whoopee. we had, yeah, we had, you know, we had done our our fire breaks and 
you know, done everything that you could think of, you know, to, to keep the fire from jumping outside, um, of where we wanted it to, but you know, there's in those big forested areas, you know, these were just little, little openings, um, you know, throughout this uh, 900 acre property I was working on, there were just random, you know, half acre openings. Um, and we were trying to get food plots established and, you know, there's so much leaf litter and, you know, down branches and all that stuff that, you know, we did almost 15 feet of a fire break and mm -hmm. that's, that fire still got through that 15 feet just through the leaves and everything else. And, um, yep. we had, wow. we had dis dissed it and rototilled it really well and that it still got through that. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's nothing to, nothing to play with for sure. You got to have Are a we plan. In, yeah. And you got a back burn and all that. And we, you know, we had, we had similar, we did, I think we did uh three tiller, you know, three, four foot tiller sections. And, um, you know, we were burning, I don't know, it was, you know, it was a, it was some grass burning and, uh, uh, we had a, a shift in wind direction, just a random shift in a, in it. All of a sudden we got a, we got a, it created a tornado of fire and it, just about got away from us and i i i ended up doing taking the the, the rain or the the mule and i did a burnout around the, the fire to try to get down to dirt just quick enough to where i could get the you know get the water on it and uh it could have been ugly so nothing like a little crap anymore. <laughs> nothing like a little uh redneck ingenuity there lincoln doing the burnout around the fire that's my kind of stuff right hey, it there worked. buddy yeah, hey, I know. that's my kind work, of stuff man. right there, buddy. Yeah, I love it. It just gave me just enough time to, you know, to get to, to slow it down a minute and and you know get get the get a nice and then you know it just like I said it, it just it took one second of of a, of, a, of a wind shift and and it was over, man. It could have been could have been ugly. So. Yeah, I think uh, as but, a yeah. disclaimer, we should always say. Um, don't try that at home unless you're you're prepared or you know if you can get the help of a local fire department or a, a fire console like you got Lincoln yeah. uh, that's pretty awesome so yeah they're and they're always willing to help too though you know I, this the Michigan prescribed uh, fire council I believe it's called and and um, you know they've got classes and and it's it's good stuff because you know I mean exactly like Chad said you know we've got a, an incredible mat of of you know 80 year old uh red pine <laughs> and um you know pine needles and short of them disturbing you know where they've disturbed it down to you know down to dirt which you know isn't you know a lot of places but i mean yeah it's going to take some time for that stuff to to get out of there so that's when we decided to talk to the fire council about it and see what they can do to help us so well, that's awesome, boys. I um, I thought that was a pretty awesome chat on on everything from uh, cult of packers to real estate to some some winter and um, logging habitat chat. Um, I have one more question I wanted to ask you guys quick. I want to know about frost seeding this time of year before we wrap this up. Are anybody, any of you guys, Chatter Lincoln, uh, frost seeding prior to all the snowfall? Uh, versus the spring um, and if so uh, please tell me why and explain your case well you want me to go Chad sure so on that note I just got a phone call here a week or so ago from um, Steve Swafford from Trophy Feast Minerals and they also sell clover seed and he he said have you ever frost seeded this time of year and I said, well, I haven't. <laughs> and I said, I've actually been, you know, I've been hearing about it recently. And um, I said, I don't, I don't have any experience of doing it, but I don't know why it wouldn't work. I mean, you know, we frost seed in, in February, you know, I mean, why wouldn't it work to do it now? And 
Um, my only thing is where we're at is we get such a huge water runoff in all of, almost all of our plots uh, in the spring when we get the snow melt. Um, so I I would have to try to minimize it to only spots that I know aren't going to flood. Um, you know, otherwise, obviously, there's a good chance your seed's going to end up, you know, in, in Lake Michigan eventually. <laughs> and, um, you know, so... Um, but I don't, I don't see why it wouldn't work. Um, I, I mean, I really don't. I, and, and I, I would like to try it and just to see what happens, but I don't have much of a area where I could do it because almost all of our plots now have, uh, you know, we top seed all of our plots. We've talked about this before with, you know, with red clover. Um, and so that we have a, you know, a, a spring growth of clover into the summer. And um, so I don't have a lot of places where I could try it, but there is one spot where I think I might be able to, to, to do it. And, you know, hopefully, hopefully I can get it. We had about four inches of snow up by the cabin this past weekend. And um, if it melts and goes away, I probably will try it. So anyway, I don't see why it wouldn't work. I really don't. I mean, like I said, you know, we do it in February. So why wouldn't it work if you did it in, you know, end of December? So. And Chadley? I don't have a, a lot of experience. Um, you know, I, I've had so much money uh, invested in equipment. You know, it was just, it was tractor and drill. You know, I had $100,000 in those two uh, pieces of equipment. And so it was just always... Um, drill it you know in the spring or summer uh, when you had your field prep done right and stuff like that now um, having said that some parcels of land I did um, so you could call it frost seeding but I still used the the drill um, in the middle of winter uh, when the ground was um, pretty hard uh, and, and actual snow on the ground, I drilled right through, you know, a few inches of snow and dropped, um, uh, you know, big blue, little blue, Indian grass, switchgrass, Canada wild rye, and about 15 different varieties of um, wildflowers and forbs into soybean stubble. And um, that turned out absolutely beautiful. Um, nice. You know, in that we did not do we did not do any spring, you know, so it was clean that fall because it was just harvested. And um, we did not have to mow that or do a spring the following, you know, the year following the planting. Um, and that one just turned out incredible. Um, so, you know, a couple that I've done, it's been, you know, not the true conventional way of frost seeding like I said we still did it with a drill um so uh you know like we were kind of talking in this text yesterday you know i um, i prefer to wait till the soil warms up and gets nice and hot you know to seed switch grass or prairie grass because that stuff needs you know they all it says you know you need 50 your soil temperature should be 55 degrees before switch and, and na some other natives and stuff are going to germinate um, uh, but I think realistically, that's probably, uh, going to be a little higher than that temperature wise. And right. I, I just prefer to get my weeds under control first and then put that seed in the ground when that's, you know, when the ground is 65 and 70 degrees and then that stuff will take off. Uh, so that's just, I mean, I've had, I've planted so much seed at the end of June and, and switch and other natives have been five, six foot tall by September. Um, I just had so much success with, uh, you know, letting the soils get warm. Um, but I, you know, I understand the guys, it's a totally different ball game when you don't have a drill, right. And so uh, mm -hmm. you're the guys, you know, wanting to, get ahead of things and, and you know the experimenting with uh simazine you know in in march 
uh, frost seeding in the winter and putting simazine on the ground, you know, in March has been pretty successful for quite a lot of people, but I've just for never, sure. I've just have not gone that route. Um, just, I guess, frankly, cause I didn't need to, but, um, you know, if you follow David Bryce on what he's got that other, is it Michigan quality deer habitat or something, Facebook page, um, mm -hmm. you know, him and I think it was, is a Jeff Sturgis and some other guys have had a ton of success with that March simazine application. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I know what you're saying. Uh, David's been on here. I think it was podcast number 32. Wow. All the way, way back then. Um, we, 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 uh, bugged him a lot about switchgrass on that one. And, and I mean, my, my preferred way to do it is the way you, you said as well, Chad, is to drill it. Wait till your weeds are definitely killed. Competition is definitely killed before you drill it. Um, and in, in terms of switchgrass, I frosty the switchgrass this last year and, uh, ended up mowing and treating with some um i think it was 24d no it was round it, i had it with glide before the switchgrass popped and then i mowed later on and i got about three foot growth year one um i was happy with it for for being our switchgrass rookie and uh i think that i guess in terms of the frost seeding I've just been seeing a lot of stuff on online on Instagram and, and Facebook about guys mm -hmm. frost seeding right now. Not even so much switchgrass, just anything. And um you know, clovers and, and chickens and whatnot, not anything, I guess. But my thought was I guess your your seed could die over the winter. Not that it would. Um, because a lot of the stuff is just dormant in this in the seed bank, yeah. anyways. I just didn't know if you guys had heard about that or not before. It's something I've been seeing and I just I haven't seen it before, so I was curious on and why people are doing it. I mean, it makes sense that right now the ground is kind of freezing and thawing, but um, it's also doing that in the spring. So I don't really. Well, you got to look at, I, I think you need to really look at um, the, the specific seed that you want to plant. And then, you know, Google is such a great tool. You know, <laughs> just Google, you know, when does, um, red clover seed become viable from the parent plant, you know, and, and so, you know, what does mother nature do? You know, is that, does, sure. does red, does red clover, um, become mature in drop seed out of the seed heads, you know, in August, September, um, you know, is it not until November or December or even January, February when there's been, um, the freezing, uh, you know, is cracking the seed heads and dropping, you know, the pod cracks and the seed drops out of the pod, you know, like w when does that hat, when does mother nature do it? And then just follow mm -hmm. that, follow that lead. Right. That's been, that's, a great that's, tip. that's been perfected over millions of years. Um, so that's, that's what I guess I would follow. Um, but there's so many successful guys out there that have been, you know, done this, uh, the, um, man, I don't know if you guys remember back the gentleman from, was it Iowa that has such a good thread or post going? Brian, he, you got this. Come on. He yeah. died a couple uh, of years ago, passed away a couple of years ago. Yeah. Double tree was his yeah. uh, Handle, online yep. name. Yeah. Yep you could read for days and days about his posts and stuff from him. Um, um, you know, I'm sure that's probably, you could, uh, he, what was that forum? I know it, some of it got bled over onto the Michigan sportsman forums, but it was, there was another forum out there that I think it, well, the QDMA forums, there was a bunch on there, but that was shut down. That's gone. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's the Iowa He's, Whitetail, uh, if I had to guess. Yeah, you could still go to iowawhitetail.com, and it's under Double Trees Habitat Corner. Yeah. Yeah, he's got a ton of stuff out there. You know, that was probably been written 10 years ago now or something, eight, something. Uh, yeah. Um, 
Paul I Knox mean, was his was his real name. By there the way. you go. Yep. There you go. Yep. So I think Jared, you got to uh, let's go back a step further. I think you really you need to look at what what your soil preparation or lack thereof, or just flat out, what is the soil that you'd like to seed into? Um, if there's a lot of exposed soil, then sure, you're, uh, that's gonna work, you know, your frost seeding's probably gonna work almost any time of the year. Uh, or uh, I know Tony Smith um, here from Eaton County. Yeah, I love Tony. He, he bought some seed from me five or six, seven years ago and said, you know, I'm going to try planting this in August. And he planted it like in early August. And, you know, I think he had a foot or so growth by the end of, you know, in a month or so, and then it just flourished. And so, um, you know, it wasn't very, he didn't have a lot invested into it, you know, so it was worth giving it a try. But um, I think it's all, you know, that's not really a question you're going to be able to answer in a, in a black and white statement. It's going to have to be based on your soil, your site prep, you know, or just what your site looks like going into it. For sure. For sure. I just didn't know if you guys ever heard of that before. Cause I had not. So it sounds like it's a better option to, uh, you know, like Chad said, depending on what your, what your frost seeding, um, follow mother nature's route or, or do it in the, in the spring. I know I sat on my main food plot the other night with my daughter and I have a big black spot kind of coming down by my blind and out in the middle of the food plot where I sprayed in September for a switchgrass uh, spring of 2021 frost seeding. So it's pretty ugly to look at all fall, but it's deader than dead and it'd be great to frost seed into here in a couple months yeah for sure yeah i think you've got a lot of uh you're gonna yeah there's a lot of opportunity for it to wash away um you know mother nature didn't doesn't care she just drops it wherever and it didn't cost her anything you know for the seed um so you know if a if a three inches of rain comes you know in a half a day and and it washes everything out, you know, it costs you a bunch of money. Um, but, uh, you know, to mother nature, it didn't. So they just, it's, it's just such a, a gamble. I think the earlier that you do it, um, I just keep leaning more and more always towards the warmer months and, um, you know, uh, proper planning, you know, goes a long ways, but, I guess it's, you know, if you're doing it for yourself, you're doing it for your clients, um, you know, how much is invested, all those things I'm going to take into consideration, you know, at the time of the year that I do it. Yeah. Yeah. We, we still got to catch up on that. Um, pheasants forever, uh, tractor, uh, and, and, uh, drill discussion we had yesterday down for my buddy, Brian's our project farm down there. So let's Mm -hmm. catch up on that. Um, but guys, that is that is all I got. Anything else from from you guys before we wrap this up? That's about it. I'm heading down to Ohio for gun season this weekend, and and uh, oh baby, and uh, hopefully, uh, I actually um, you had you had talked about the 700 Club here a while back in one of the podcasts. I think with Tony. It was with and, Tony. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not a member of the the Michigan 700 Club, but I am uh, now with my Illinois buck this year. I'm 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 a member of the 700 Club, so <laughs> so I was pretty excited about that. And and for Very cool. for everybody who doesn't know, that's explain what that is, Lincoln. Congratulations. Thanks, man. That's that's your, your top that's five your top. bucks. Top three. <laughs> <laughs> top top three, yeah, I wish. Yeah. I wish. Top but, ten. Uh, yeah, it's your, your top, yeah, top ten. Well, it used to be when you know, <laughs> we do hunt in Michigan, but right. But uh but yeah, so so with that with a my buck I killed in, in Illinois this year, we hit the seven hundred club. So I think it's like seven hundred and fifteen inches in my top five. So Wow. Sweet. So that's work, buddy. pretty cool. 
Well, it sounds like you guys have had some uh, good and interesting seasons so far. I I wish you all, all three of you guys, luck getting out this weekend. I'm hoping to get down to Ohio um, for muzzle loader. So that'd be the the first of the year. I don't know why I'm getting my muzzle loader back mm-hmm. out, but I'm gonna try it again and get some redemption and just I don't know. I should. I, I think I don't know. Anyways, I'm doing that, and that'll be probably the. I think it starts on the second through the fifth, maybe. We got to see if we actually get some weather. If we're not getting weather, um, it's going to be a tough hunt, but we'll see. Um, but I wish you guys luck, man. Yeah. That sounds awesome. Get out there and let me know. Sounds like a plan. Thanks for having us, man. Yeah, thank you, guys. Hey, of Appreciate course. You coming on. As, as, a, as always, thanks for what you guys are doing for, uh, you know, for for educating. And uh, I think it's just, I think it's just, just fantastic. Uh, what your what your show is done and just keep it up thank you link really do appreciate it and um for anybody who wants to find these two gentlemen and their companies uh all you have to do is go to habitatpodcast.com their logos are on the homepage, and there are links to both their companies real estate and call to packing so gentlemen good luck and um stay safe this weekend and we'll talk to you soon all right, thanks again. Right, Good, luck, guys. Good luck. Be safe. All right, talk to you. Bye. See you guys. Thank you so much, listeners, for coming and listening once again to the Habitat Podcast. We really appreciate it. If you could, please do us a favor, leave us a five star review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast. If you type out something nice, I will send you a free Habitat Podcast decal. If you haven't been to our website, habitatpodcast.com, we have our Habitat property consultation services on there under the land plan tab. Check out our HP land plans there. We also have hats, t-shirts, and decals up at habitatpodcast.com. Of course, all of our podcast episodes. And then we have a new Habitat podcast journal where you can learn about deer anatomy and some cool thoughts, um, You know, more of a blog post from us every now and then. We'd really love it if you went over to our Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, found the Habitat Podcast, and please subscribe. That really helps us. And thank you very much to our sponsors. We have Michigan Whitetail Pursuit, Packer Max Cultipackers, Huntwise, Killer Food Plots, The Habitat Hook, Realtree United Country Land Pro, Lake States Realty and Auction. Sound Barrier Hunting, and Morse Nursery. Thank you so much, guys, for tuning in once again. Get back with us soon. We're going to have another great episode for you as we become better habitat managers.